Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay Moore. This is Greg Cruz. This is Bryce Vine. This is Dexter from The this Offspring. Is Nathan this East. is Sebastian Younger. This is Daryl Amy. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. This is Dr. Bob Greenberg. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. <laughs> this is Bernie Taylor, guest on the Break It Down show. I'm the author of Before Ryan, Find the Face of the Hero. Listen in today. And now, the Break It Down show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. This is a friend of Brian Keating, Dr. Brian Keating, who's given us a bunch of guests. And actually, we're going to have Brian on uh, shortly. So this show may come out actually after we do Brian's because we're going to load something up for a specific date for him. But thanks to Brian and the shout out to him for his great work and, and for introducing us to Bernie, who's I guess the best thing to call you is a thought leader and a storyteller because you're part anthropologist, you're part you know what it's well i'm gonna shut up and have you explain what what the heck it is that you do because god dang actually absolutely that's a good question well i see myself as a naturalist and in the naturalist that maybe like sitting bull was mm-hmm. or chief joseph um native americans were animists they believe that the there was life in the world around them in the cosmos and that there was an order and rhythms to the how the salmon ran and how the, the deer and the elk rutted and so I see myself as a naturalist, somebody who's in tune with, with the natural world. And famous naturalists are Jane Goodall. Uh, before she worked on the chimps, she was working with her dog. And when she went to work with the chimps, she actually had no educational background. She didn't have a, an, uh, any college education until many years later. Um, Teddy Roosevelt was a hunter and a fisherman before he became president. Another famous naturalist, John Muir, I'm not exactly sure, but he ultimately became the most famous naturalist there's ever been. Charles Darwin, of course, was a naturalist, and he did most of his training in the field. And when you're in the field for, um, on the woods and the water for a period of time, you start to ask questions. And questions such as, why do the salmon come earlier or later from one year to the next, but they're always in synchrony? Do they follow one smart fish? Um, and the answer is they don't. Okay. Um, but it's, it's, it's a question that daunted uh, wildlife fishery biologists for many years. And I posed I, in a previous book, biological time, I studied the question, and it came up with a measurable answer, um, and an answer that you could actually time this, all the events of the salmon, including when they spawn, to the day, um, at least the peak to the day. And so one could actually go to the river and go fishing and know, you know, if, if salmon are present in that river, um, you could pick the right times and so on to catch, and days to be there when you catch a salmon. And Native Americans had this in their calendars. Um, They had their calendars um, for many animals and plants across North America. And uh, so I took that concept of the Native American timing and I said, well, maybe it's deeper in time. Because Native Americans came across the Bering Strait region or actually inhabited the Bering Strait 23,000 years ago. And so maybe if I went back to the caves in Europe, the Paleolithic caves from 20, 30,000 years ago, I might find the same animist, um, the same naturalist patterns and rhythms in their art and that's where we, that's where we that's where, where we are now yeah. um, in this time and place where we're, we're looking through the minds of the paleolithic artists from thirty four thousand years ago and what we're seeing inside his mind it's the same as ours okay 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 all right i, I think i get what you're saying now so this parallels nicely with what I did and a lot of people know what I did but I I went overseas I was a spy but I also kind of did spying from an anthropological point of view because the system the military system the US system was to to bring and deliver democracy and capacity but the reality when I went on the ground was is they have rule of law we don't see it as it but but you know you don't just get to change the system for free like you have to find out how to get you know, the, the salmon are already going one direction and they start, you know, they have a schedule and, and their schedule's full. They go here, they go there, they spawn, they go up the river. All those things are, are on a timetable. Same thing with, with, uh, with Afghans, with Iraqis, with Americans. We all do things in, in a certain pattern that's discernible if you sit back and, and you shut up and you listen and, and you, allow, you allow the weird to overtake you until weird becomes normal that's sort of how i approach it so i I take a look and i look for what their normal is what our normal is i don't know if you know about liminal space but i sort of enter different liminal realities 
and I try to start to go, okay, this is what these guys are saying and doing. Here's where we are. We're nowhere near each other. How do we nudge this reality towards a common reality? Does that make sense at all? It, it actually makes a lot of sense. And here's, here's an interesting point how the two overlap. In the Paleolithic caves, they're pre- predominantly of animals. And in the ones that I work on, I, I, that I, I describe in the book for Ryan and these much, many of the YouTube videos, there's some people as well. And in the case where you have these people, they actually overlap with the animals. And so a, a man overlaps with a dolphin and becomes a merman. Mm-hmm. A man overlaps with a horse and becomes a centaur. The man overlaps with a, a giraffe, the head of a giraffe and some mythical animal we haven't, we didn't reinvent. Um, and so what happens is that in the Paleolithic mind, they not as the animus, they just didn't see the, the clouds as being spirits and the mountains as gods and the, the animals as their brothers and sisters. They actually, um, their spirit in their spiritual world, they connected with them. Mm-hmm. They learned from them. Um, they had gained wisdom from them. And in most of these images, they're actually female animals um, and that the, the human characters overlap with. And so one could possibly have a matriarchal society. Um, because we're, we're, we're at that time, we're, we're definitely learning from the, the female characters. And so what we have, we have this mix between the two, but we st- back 34,000 years ago, but we still have it today. So if you think about superheroes, well, the latest one is Ant-Man, Batman, mm-hmm. Spider-Man. We, we mix with the animals in our, in our psyche to become one with them. And we g- gain strength from them in the same way that these characters did in the Paleolithic images. And so we haven't, we're, we would like to say, well, we're not animists anymore. We're thinking, man, we're, we're people of science. But the fact is, is that we project, when we project our psyche out there, we project it, we pick up the animals around us and we bring it back in us. Um, we see the world through the eyes of animals. Some as smart as an, an owl, they're as fast as a horse and, you know, a bull in a china stop, shop, stubborn as a mule. We keep using these metaphors because we see, our, we see the animals within ourselves. Okay, okay. So these characters, Aquaman, Ant-Man, Batman, all of these things, these combinations, this is, is this, and I know you kind of guess, wait, let me back up. When we look at things like cave writing, I was trying to think like what that must be like because these are this the only things that we have left. Like the uh, most of the statues from antiquity are gone. You know, most mm-hmm. of the masterpieces either were destroyed in an earthquake or you know just disappeared. So the same thing must be true of paintings. But do you get a sense that when you look at cave, uh, you know the um, the engravings, the paintings? that they're 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 much more gosh i don't know you know artists always push the bounds right and so you've, you've got these early minds is pushing the bounds what we would consider completely pedestrian in terms of what's crazy i mean putting together two animal figures to tr- explain something that seems to make sense because we don't know what these things are like that must be a mermaid that that how does how does this thing survive in water i see it breathing like i do um is when 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 people draw on these things, is there array of possibilities? Do you think it's limited because it's so early on, or is this just what we have to play with? I believe that we haven't changed. Okay. I believe that this pelvic mind is still within us, that we still project our psyche out there and that we we see ourselves within the the animals. So if you think if you if, if you jumped off an airplane, and middle, and you didn't know where you're gonna where you were, and you land in a bunch of pandas. <laughs> where are you? China. You're in China, of course. Unless it's a zoo, you're in China. Okay. Right. And of course, China's national animal is the panda. The United States is the 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 uh, bald eagle, um, and Russia is the bear. Okay. Mm-hmm. And Spain is the bull. So we we through our nationalities and our sports teams and our states and our high schools and every freaking everything that we do. We identify with the, with the animals within us. Um, we draw strength from those animals, and so the you know the the bull su- football team is going to look a lot better than let's say the cardinal football team, right? Right. Uh, um, we still have that that presence, and so we haven't changed very much. So what? The, well, I have to correct you on something because I I didn't know this until recently that 
there actually were in, in uh, mythology, there were merman, mermen. Sure. So it's not a mermaid. The, so it's a man that overlaps with the, with the dolphin. So it's a merman. Okay. And I, in previous interviews, I was calling the mermaid man. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, but anyway, going back to, so th- w- this, in this gallery disc image, which is predominant one that I use, you have a man that's going on a journey. And the journey is from the Iberian Peninsula, which is now Spain. He travels across the Strait of Royalty. He goes to Africa and he returns back again. And on his journey, he encounters these animals. So he is, there's animals that are unique to the Iberian Peninsula. There's animals that are unique to Africa, for example, a giraffe. Um, and he encounters them and draws strength from them. And we can tell where he is on his journey because of the animals, mm-hmm. because there were no giraffes in Europe anywhere t- in that time period uh, it was, you know, it was millions of years ago. They might've been in Europe, but not any, in that time period, 30,000 years ago. Um, and there's animals that are in Europe. This is, for example, the Iberian lynx is not in Africa and t- we have no record that it ever was in Africa. So we have animals that are on two sides of the water where we find the, the seal, we have a crab and we have the um, dolphin and these animals are, are European and they're African. And as the, as the, as the character, this hero goes on his journey, he leaves Europe and, and encountering those animals and he draws strength from them, emotional strength. He learns about their, their interrelationships with their young because they typically they show it's a mother um, animal with its young. Um, and, but he also learns where he is geographically, where by those animals. Mm-hmm. And so just the same way that if you jumped off an airplane, you landed in, in um, China, it, sort of pandas, you say, oh, I'm in China. Well, he did the exact same thing 34,000 years ago. And that was how they tell, that's one way that they found their, their way in space, that they could navigate. It was by, they didn't have road signs. Um, right. <laughs> they navigated by the animals that they encountered. Okay, and probably the vegetation too, like when, like now I'm seeing ferns, well, so I'm in. Well, absolutely. I'm sure, I'm sure by the vegetation, is, and of course the water bodies and so on. Mm-hmm. But, but um you know, you could have some sort of fern on both sides of Stranger Bolter. Sure. But there's a giraffe on one side, and then there's a um, Iberian lynx on the other. Yeah, um, yeah. And so if you guys are looking, Rob, his name is Bernie Taylor, and you can look up before Orion.com, and there's a ton of videos and a lot of Bernie explaining a lot of these concepts. So it's if you're like me and you're struggling to understand it and trying to sort it out, you definitely can go to his website, and you guys should and check it out. And he's real active on social media, so you can yeah. also grab his attention there. Okay. So Joseph Campbell spoke about this. Yes. Joseph Campbell spoke about the hero's journey, and that's the hero's journey we fought, that Star Wars was modeled after. George sure. Lucas was buddies with Joseph Campbell, and they worked together on finding these archetypal motifs that these stories that are within us all and the characters that we can relate to. And, of course, we can relate to you know Batman, Spider-Man, and so on because, again, we have this animism within us. So anyway, Joseph Campbell comes up with the story of this hero's journey, and he asked – Joseph Campbell wrote that – he didn't really know where it came from, but he, he, you know, maybe it could have been some cave in Siberia because Native Americans have the same story. People around the world have the same fundamental myth. Um, but he also said, you know, maybe it's in these caves in, in Europe as well. And he looked in the caves and he didn't find the human. He didn't see the human characters that we can now see through these high resolution images. Um, and we, so we we have information that Joseph Campbell didn't have. And Joseph Campbell and, and other people like the Swiss psychoanalyst Young, most of their data was going back to the time of like, or psychological data was back to the time of Gilgamesh, the great story yeah. of, the, of the hero, and which is about 4,500 4, years ago. And psychology works on this basis that we, well, Gilgamesh has the same archetypal themes, the metaphors and that we have in story today. Therefore, nothing's changed in 4,500 years. But now we can actually look at this. We can say, well, nothing's actually changed in 34,000 years. <laughs> yeah. Because we have the same stories. And so that gap in time of 30,000 years just closed in on us. And we, we, you know, if when you and I were going to high school, there was this concept of knuckle dragging mm-hmm. cavemen who, and, and the women were, you know, running around as slaves or something. But now we have this, this completely different vision of our past. We have artists that are more incredible than anybody we have in today's animation or in modern arts from the time in the recent past. We'll talk on Picasso. In fact, Picasso had come out of the Altamira cave in, in um, Spain near to this gallery of discs. And he, he said, 
I couldn't have done this. And none of our, my friends could have done this. This is not a forgery. And so they had brought Picasso in to test. In fact, it was a forgery. And he said, this is beyond anything that we can do. And what Picasso does, he takes characters from the Altamira cave. He uses them in his first art, cubism art, Les Dames d'Avignon. He mm-hmm. later uses them in Guernica and many other of his, his most famous images. Picasso b- borrows characters from tens of thousands of years, years ago, not just the exact image, but he borrows the metaphors. Mm-hmm. And he takes them into the modern time. And that gives us what we believe today to be modern art. But you know something? It's not. That Picasso borrowed it from the Paleolithic past. And uh, and the, Im- the very important is the image that he, two images that he used for his first Le Dame d'Avignon, 1907, were from Altamira, is their horses. Mm-hmm. So he took these, these, these images of horses and he put them over the masks of two women, in uh, women of the street, these prostitutes in Spain. And so he, transfor- he transforms them into um, centaurs of sorts, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, he, he, take, he finds the, the, the animism within those, those female characters and he projects that in, into his art. So, that, so Picasso hadn't left behind this animist past. He brought it from the past to our time today. And we still live with the idea that, you know, Picasso invented modern art, but he did. He was brilliant, but he didn't invent modern art. It's been invented for a while. Actually, I recall a couple of days ago, maybe a week or two ago, a, another finding where it goes, it basically doubled the time. I think, you know, if the cave drawings we know about are 40,000 years old, this took it to like 70 or 80,000 years ago. It was in South Africa. I don't know if you saw the story, but more pig. Found oh, yeah, I did see that. Yeah, that was, that was like in Saudi Arabia. Oh, 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 okay, okay, that's different. That was in, um, that's actually in South Africa. Yeah, yeah. What that was, is um, there was oak, there was red ochre on like stripe marks on top of a piece of rock. Right. Uh, that ca- that cave had actually previously been shown to have the oldest markings on rock, which are very similar to those of the the paint, the red ochre paint that you saw. Mm-hmm. Um, so what they did was the markings on the rock were previously disputed, so maybe someone just doodled it. Um, but now we find similar work of the the red ochre that so. The guy didn't unless it, they doodled the same thing. It didn't happen, so that was kind of that was kind of important to find. But those images are of maybe some sort of tally mark or some mm-hmm. something. Mm-hmm. What we're talking about in the cave in Spain, in this El Castillo cave with Gallery of Discus, we're talking about characters that we can look at them and we can identify mm-hmm. not just the animals, but we can see the human characters and see their emotions. There's a woman who has long braided red hair, and she's obviously in distress. She has, you know, her, her chin is, is down and her, her, you can see her cheeks are kind of not like an older woman's cheeks, but they're sagging, but they're just like, she, she just doesn't look happy. And so these, these artists had the ability, they were highly um, empathetic people. They saw the, the beauty in the world around them. They saw the emotions. They, they felt what the people in their world felt. These were not knuckle dragging cavemen. Um, and so the, the difference between the South African finding and this one is that we're, we're in an age of um, modernity mm-hmm. that goes tens of thousands of years. But that's a, that was a good one to point out. Thank you. You know, the other thing I'm, I'm always wondering, too, is, is we feel like as humans, you know, we, we sense patterns, often get mostly get those wrong, I would say. And the other thing is, is we get a sense for self, right? Like this is like where enlightenment comes from, like we were able to get out of self and see other perspectives and it changes the self, you know, and you're like, oh, this is, I do play a part in this system. That has to go back as far back as people have thought about things. I mean, just by getting older and surviving, you realize I've mostly been an asshole most of my life. If I quit being so focused on me and I at least focused on being a better person for everybody else i will have more enjoyment and they will have more enjoyment and so we're all going to be in a better place that that archetype that actually must be an archetype and that must go back ten thousand. of course it is exactly and so what you're you you have become the wise man the older man <laughs> and in this cave image at el castillo we find an older man speaking to the ear of a young boy and the young, young boy's his eyes are wide open and his lips are pursed and he's intently listening. 
Um, and so, yes, the, the, the story of the teacher and the apprentice that we find through myths everywhere. And, yeah. and it could be older woman, the younger, the young girl. It doesn't matter. But we find that you are now the wise men. And now and you're on air, you know, interacting with people like me and Brian and others. And you're absorbing our stuff, but you're also passing it on to the greater audience. So you are you are the podcast wise man at this moment. Yes, which is pretty cool. Um, it is cool. You know, one of the questions I ask a lot, especially on my uh, on my technology podcast, Popping the Bubble, which everybody should check out. P o p p i n g t h e b u b b l dot com. Popping the bubble. But one of the things I always ask, like all these really smart technology people that are just rocketing us forward into the future, more data, more ability to crunch data. Are we any wiser? And it gives all of them a pause because it's such a powerful question when you think, are we? And now I'm thinking, I'm realizing that's a forward projected question. You know, like we have all this access to information, but are we any wiser than they were 40,000, 73,000 years ago? Absolutely not. And I'm going to give you a good example. So you, you looked at the videos and you start at, you remember seeing some animals that mm-hmm. saw the elephant for sure. And some others. Mm-hmm. Okay. And on that same panel. So you, so you, you, you remember seeing a few, correct? Yeah, of course. Yes. Okay. Well that, that of course is a big, we're going to tell you, you know, here's the punchline that we didn't start off with the gallery of discs. Um, was found over first found over a hundred years ago in mm-hmm. El Castillo Cave, and until my work, nobody saw anything but red discs. Oh, okay. so this panel right. is about ten meters across, maybe eighty or so red discs. Each red disc is about the size of the palm of your hand. So everybody was counting the red discs. There's scores of of, of research that will say there's nothing there but red discs. Blank, blank, blank. So why did everybody? Why didn't they look beyond these red discs? Why didn't they see the forest, the trees? They were counting the red discs. Mm-hmm. And those red discs are draw- we d- were drawn to them. And there was an interesting spir- uh, experiment done a few, a few years ago by a fellow named um, Nicholas Tinberger. And Tinberger won a, no- won a Nobel Prize for his book, The Study of Instinct. And in his work, he, he had a, a fish tank by the window. And every time, every day, a red delivery truck came by, the fish went into a defensive posture. And so they were reacting to the red. Now, Tinberg and re- reasoned that, that they couldn't think about reacting to the red because they, re- they don't have the cerebral hemispheres, the cognitive thinking, that, the gray matter that we have. And so it was brainstem dominant, something deep inside of them. And so we react to red stop signs, you know, red and McDonald's, DQ and Burger King. Sure. Um, and all this other red in our world because it's brainstem dominant. It's something within us. So the millions of people that saw these images, the same ones that you saw, whether they saw them in the, in the media, whether it's online, or they actually saw them face-to-face, they, they were drawn into counting those red discs. Mm. They were stimulated by the red, and they didn't see the elephant in the room. In fact, so this, this life-size elephant is in front of them, but the Paleolithic artists hid it behind the red discs. Yeah. Because we're drawn to the red disc. So, ha- so here's a so back to your question on the: Have we learned anything in thirty four thousand years? <laughs> yeah, have we? I mean, you know, we we feel like again in our time, we feel like you know our time is the worst, where our time is the best. But you know, you you look at and Romans had surgery. You know, <laughs> like there's all these parallels where even in terms of science, yeah, it's a little different. But is it really when you consider you know if you had one percent change per year, surgery would be wildly better, and it's largely the same process. I mean, it's safer and everything else, but <laughs> you know. If if Romans at the at zero, you know, <laughs> year zero, if they were operating and doing brain surgery, um, you know, yeah, like are we are we appreciably any better? You know, yeah, we have antibiotics, but heck, we find. A, how about that um, that ancient Machina Antica that that thing? They just keep trying to figure out what the heck and how did they build that thing? You, you know, it's and then I'm always struck by. We look at music a lot on this show, and one of the things is, is as new forms come out, you know, there's a lot of experimentation and, and frankly, getting it wrong until, like, you know, the art form reaches its zenith and evolves and becomes something else. I mean, classical music is still made today, but I think we can all agree, like, the greatest classical music ever was made uh, 150, 200 years ago when, during Mozart and Wagner and all those guys. So, 
it, the same must be true for cave art in terms of the artistic expression where like the first guy's like, I want to draw me a giraffe. And he's like, ah, I can't damn figure out what the, you know, he doesn't necessarily have yellow, so he can't do that. And he's trying to describe something or even like uh, looking at the, at the stars and mapping out the zodiac, right? Like that's Orion. Like which stars you? I mean, there's there's no light pollution, so you can see everything. There's a bazillion stars in the sky. And you're trying to say those eight? Don't you see those? St-? And trying to make the pattern. You're like, let me show you on the wall over here. And then you all of a sudden you paint out Orion, and it becomes a hunter. Am I am I making too much of a leap with that? No, you're not at all. And so we talked. I talked about these characters on the cave wall and Elkis in the gallery of deaths. All those characters are actually constellations. Mm, okay. Okay. And so the and that's actually where we get the constellations from. The Greeks, although the ancients had gone to these caves, and they they actually took the whole um, the whole portfolio. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> and so I'd mentioned the the merman before. That's Aquarius. Okay. Mm-hmm. And the cent the centaur is Sagittarius. Mm-hmm. Okay? Of course, right? Yeah, that makes and, sense. Uh, so the. The, so and, and this 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 hero on his journey that's depicted depicted in the gallery disc is uh, the story of Hercules, the myth of Hercules, um, and he goes he goes all the same places that Hercules goes on and his final labors, and so constellations that's really important. So I had said that the the animals on the on the ground are um, where he saw them on his journey. Well, he actually saw them in the night sky as well, okay. and so they had the pelvic man had projected their vision of what those animals were into the night sky. And so when he, the horse is an animal that was in Europe and wasn't in um, West North Africa. And so he not only did, he was following the animals on the land, but he was also following them in the night sky. It was his first map. Hmm. And the first, so I believe that, so this is 34,000 years ago. We have the, the entire record that the, the ancient Greeks had. This, the ancient Greeks didn't have many more. Um, and maybe they had something that was, much further north, but the, most of the constellations of the ancient Greeks are in this are in this um, this particular. This episode of the Break It Down Show is brought to you by Lions Rock Productions. That's us. We publish, evaluate, and develop podcasts just like this one. Consult others to build their own and create associated content and content marketing strategies. So, if you're launching or expanding your social media presence, your business, or your personal brand, or if you just want to take your media presence to the next level, reach out to us on Twitter at Pete Turner or at John LG sixty nine at the Break It Down Show. There's a thousand ways to get a hold of us. Now enjoy the show. Much further north, but the, most of the constellations of the ancient Greeks are in this are in this um, this particular cave panel, ten meters across. Hmm. And uh, but ha- ha- that wasn't the first constellations. That wasn't the first time we had constellations because people don't start. Um, you don't put the constellations onto the cave wall, just as you you know you don't write a book. You tell the story before you write the book, right? You tell the story around the campfire for thousands of years before it ends up into a movie. And so the first constellations are going back to what you had mentioned, where it's probably Orion. Because around the world, we have Orion. Mm-hmm. We also have Cirrus as a dog, sure. even though there's there's nothing that says Cirrus looks like a dog. But around the world, we have Cirrus <laughs> as a dog. We have Ursa Major as a legged animal and often as a bear. And when it's a bear, it's a she-bear. Mm-hmm. And so that's an important one as well. And the other one are the Pleiades. Um, and the stars in Taurus, um, and in and the versions around the world, there are a group of people, typically women, and Orion is chasing them. Um, so we, there was a point in time, even deeper than this cave, that we had had a common mythology that we were from the same place and we saw the same stars, and we carry those around the world in Ursa Major, Orion, Pleiades, and Cirrus as a dark. Um, and then later on, you know, later on, 34,000 years ago, which is still like a really long time ago, um, in historical terms, it's in fact, it's like, it's unfathomable in historical terms because we don't have any history beyond, you know, Gobekli Tepe is 12,000 years ago. We don't really have anything beyond that in history. So we actually have a historical event in, the, in this image. And so, but anyway, the, you were right on with, with Orion that they could see him in the night sky. And not only they could see him in the night sky, but they could watch him on his journey. So as Orion um, is low on the horizon, he, he approaches the mountain, he's climbing it. Mm. And when, 
passes through the mountain. He's entered the mountain. He's died. And when he, he comes out of the mountain, he's reborn, which is fundamentally the same story of Jesus. Jesus, he dies. They put him in the cave. And he comes out a few days later. And so the, we have the, these myths are embedded in our, in, throughout our religions. We can't escape from them. And they go back to these great heroes, um, the hero on his journey that we see in the night sky wherever we are around the world. Yeah, and I guess you could take this back to the ancient Greeks. And, and before Jesus, there was Dionysus. You know, he did the same thing, water to wine, yes. fed everybody fish and loaves. You know, like it's the same It's the same dude. <laughs> so, uh, and that's not to disparage anybody who's, who's Christian or anything at all, but we have these stories that – are, somehow have a latency to them from from epoch to epoch because you're not even talking generations here you're talking large you know 400 year ages where this story has it morphs and evolves and but it travels and and it gets there on its own and and it does make you wonder how does cirrus become a dog in all these different places because orion looks like uh, you know, uh, a man, yeah. a, a man, right? It's got a waist, but Cirrus <laughs> doesn't look like anything. It's just, uh, it's just one really bright star with a bunch of stars around it. Like, how do you make a pattern, and, and why that pattern over one of the other ones? It's because we came from the same place. The myth came from the same place and traveled around the world. That's why. And uh, and it's and so I, I actually in these public images I have dogs. Mm -hmm. And they're in the place of Cirrus. Um, and there's one dog. It has a, has a star on its flank that is astronomically perfectly from where Cirrus would be. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's really interesting that um, we come from that same place. And we tell the same – we, we may the hero may change from a man to a woman. So sure. Moana in the, in, the, in the Disney Hawaiian version is female. Uh, so we – and most of the Disney movies now have female heroes, which is cool. Um, and, you know, even the new James Bonds, we have we have heroines, right? You know, the, the hero still goes on the journey. You know, Alice goes down the down the hole. Mm -hmm. um, um, go, um, Wizard of Oz. Um, Dorothy. Dorothy. Dorothy goes on the journey. Um, Frodo goes on the journey to Morador. Um, it's a we carry these stories around the world. The Chinese have a story called journey to the West where a monk takes the fundamentally the same journey as, um, as Frodo, but right. he actually go, he, he picks up characters along the way and he, he, he gets the sacred scrolls and then he, he, he comes back home to, to share them with the Kings. So we tell these, we have the same mythology around the world and that's what young, that's what young was tied to. Not, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, actually young. That's what Joseph Campbell was tied to. Mm. Joseph Campbell was saying that everybody around the world is fundamentally saying this story, has the same path of travel that they go through. Therefore, there must be some either something out conscious that carries this, or we all came from the, from the same place. And Joseph Campbell actually drew a lot of his work from the Swiss psychoanalyst Carl Jung. Mm -hmm. And Joseph Campbell had wrote the portable Jung. And Joseph and um, Young had a dream. This is a really important dream because it ties together how we see the world today in meth. Young had a dream that he walks down the hallway in an old house and the pla and the paint's coming off. As it continues down, he sees the paint still coming off, but it's plaster from like ancient Greece or Rome. And so he, he's, he's, he says, I'm going to a different time. Continuing down the hallway, he's, he has um, a rock, like a, a, a cave rock, um, and, and, um, and um, soil on, on the sides for the walls. And he recognizes that he has now traveled back in time to the Paleolithic caves. And he says, you know, he emerges from the stream and says, the Paleolithic mind is still our own. We're telling the same stories. So he, he, he goes on this journey early in his life to gathering all the mythology he can from around the world. And he starts saying, this is fundamentally the same story. And that's, and Joseph Campbell later um, borrowed those, that concept and developed into a more, a uh, a more systemized structure from what we now to we know today is the hero's journey and which is told which which is taught in um, high schools across north america sure 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 it's yeah it's part of us yeah we it's codify. our own myth right <laughs> yeah okay so we have to ask the question when we see all these things is there the one thing that we have learned i think is that 
genetics has a much greater role on who we are than we have ever really understood. You know, just the mix of the different genes together. And it's not because you're a hundred percent like your mom or your dad, or you may not even be like a good amalgamation of the two. Maybe there's just a weird mix, but we're learning a lot more about that. So is, are we talking about a genetic pattern where there's just some, <laughs> some, okay. I'm going to, I'm going to, I prophesize this. I'm going to uh-huh. tell you right now. Okay. I'm not a prophet, but I prophesize. You know how I could prophesize this, that hmm. question? Because every podcast, every presentation I've given, they've asked me the same question. Yeah. And I've given, you know, astronomers and physicists and anthropologists and paranormal psychics. And by the way, psychics shouldn't be asking that question. They should know the answer. They should know the answer, right. They know the answer. But everybody asked me the exact same question. And it's about halfway through the, you know, 25, 30 minutes yeah, of yeah. the interview. Because they get to this, it's been do, it's been juggling around their head. They read some stuff that I did before. They watch the YouTubes, and they're like, you know, how does this really work? It's it's hard to keep up with the the, the thing. I'll be honest. Like, I, you know, I want to make sure I'm asking good questions. But you're right. Like, oh I, no, I'm you just asked the big one. You asked the question that every listener by this point is is asking yeah. as well. And um, and I'm going to give you the answer as I see it. Okay. okay. And um, and we we really don't we don't have an answer. There's really no knowing. But we can actually kind of get to the bottom of it of sorts. Mm. And I'm going to give you the perspective of something I experienced in my life. Okay. I live in Portland, Oregon, near the Oregon Zoo. Mm-hmm. Fabulous zoo if you're into zoos. If you don't like zoos and you think animals should only be in Africa, don't go. <laughs> okay. So in, the, in this zoo, we have a, a lion um, area. And there's a male lion who is always at the top of the heap. The female is in the center. And there's a young male at the bottom. And in, in Africa, that all makes sense because the lion at the top protects the, the pride. And if another lion comes by that challenges him and takes him over, he will then kill the, the youngest lions, the cubs. Okay. So he, he's, he's, the, he's, he, he's, the, um, he's the Don, right? Right. Um, he's the Don <laughs> of the mafia family. You know, there's Don Corleone, yeah. there's Don Gambino, there's Don Trump. You know, he's the Don. Okay. So the, we have this lion at the top of the heap. Well, that all makes sense in Africa. Right. Um, make any sense in the Oregon too, because these animals are fed. Mm-hmm. So why do they keep the, that same position and have those same dynamics? Well, for him to have become the, the, the head, the don at the top, he'd ha- he had to have some chutzpah, right? Mm-hmm. He had to have some testosterone flowing. He had to be able to say, the, the, you know, the, the, the women of the pack and the, and the pride, you know, got, just keep it down. I'm here at the top. But he also can't let the, the young the young lion at the bottom because that's threatening his his power. Okay, so I, maybe I'm projectile of human psyche into these animals, and maybe this is in the Lion King as well. But really, these animals they're acting like humans in a way, and they're acting in such a way that they're it's in them. So they 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 carry on. If a lion doesn't have it, the male lion doesn't have this testosterone, he can't be sitting at the top of the pack. Right. Just the women are going to kick him off. Um, and so the, the lions that survive, the lions that go on, are the ones that have that, become the leaders, are the ones with the heavy testosterone, which again, of course, then allows them to impregnate the females and carry on the lion and so forth. And so within natural human, I'm sorry, animal behavior, we have human behavior. behavior. The only difference between us and those lions in that tank is we can tell the story, just as I ex- just expressed it to you. It's yeah. naturally within the lions. And the same that we pass on or the personality characteristics in the lions, in the same way that you pass on blue eyes or blonde hair or a red hair or short, tall, um, or even we have personality characteristics that we take from our parents. And so they're passed in the same way. Is that genetics? I don't know. I, you know, because we don't actually have, you know, a sp- specific genetic um, trait for, you know, being the, the Lion King. OK, mm-hmm. right, right, right. <laughs> and you actually have to prove yourself to be the Lion King. You just don't just get there. Right. And so we ca- we carry on these these archetypal characters, the old and the young, the the, the protective females and the perfect protective male, the Don. Um, we carry them on in our own psyche whether or not they're taught to us. So, and when these archetypes are countered, the stories are evoked. So, so there's a bunch of other, of course, it's big zoo. There's a bunch of other animals, there's elephants and there's giraffes and there's hippos. And if, if they could chime in to what I just said and, you know, give their own kibitzen, 
we'd have the Lion King and that would be the movie. <laughs> right. Um, so the animals have these, these behaviors within them in the same way that we still react to the red as the, the fish in Tin Bergen's tank. They're um, deep within our brains. Are they carried from one person to another DNA? I would probably say yes, as opposed to download from the cloud or something. And the reason is that we have personality characteristics that come to us from both of our parents. Um, and these are based on personality characteristics. So then why do, so then the, so, so we can just, I'm going to say that we have these archetypal characters. We have these because of um, it's basic animal behavior. The okay. only difference is that we tell the story as far as we know, they can't tell the story. Right. Okay. Now, so why do we tell this? How can we tell the story and why do we tell the story? And does that make any difference? Why do we have these myths? Well, sometime, somewhere along the line, we developed the ability to have speech. And we had speech, we could have more elaborate stories. Whereas chimpanzees act out stuff. They act out behaviors that they, each one can recognize. Chimpanzees in the wild probably have about 40 ge um, um, hand body gestures. And so, but there's, we actually have that ability to speak and tell the story. And by us having the ability to speak, we can step above the chimpanzees because I can tell you a story wherever you are right now mm -hmm. that someone in Europe would also understand and someone in China would understand because they have that same, same mythological structure in their storytelling. We have common beliefs, whereas chimpanzees, a chimpanzee in, in Africa really doesn't have much beliefs, but very different from the ones in the Oregon Zoo here from the perspective of their, you know, they look at each other, well, you know, we're both, we're both chimps, but you know, we, we don't share the same God or we don't, we share, we, we don't share the absence of the, of a God sure. or um, whatever, whatever the belief is. So as we go around the world, we have the ability to communicate with each other because I believe that you will treat me honorably on this podcast. And you believe that I'm not going to say it's a wild, nutty thing that's going to embarrass you, even though you could edit out afterwards. Yeah. Um, but the, so we have that belief between the two of us. We have a myth between us that we will treat each other honorably. In the United States, well, we have democracy. Well, the Koch brothers and Bernie Sanders have a completely different view of democracy. You know, but we, they come together because they ultimately believe that given this the myth of democracy, if we all gather around it, we're not going to perpetually be in a civil war. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, around the world, we have the, the same concepts. Uh, Christian countries tend to get along with each other better than Muslim countries. But then when the Muslim myth was separated between the Shunis, Sunnis and the Shiites, then they became at war with each other. Okay. And so these, these myths are important. And these myths allowed us to, you know, we weren't just, you know, tribes roaming about. We were tribes that met other tribes that we had no encounter with before. And we could share the same myth. We could point to the night sky and Orion, and we could point to Ursa Major and say, he's hunting Ursa Major. Um, and we could point to our dog and, and Osiris and say, that's the dog. So we, we have the ability to share these myths, and the, the storyboard is in the night sky above us. By us being able to share these myths, we could communicate, we could work together, and we could constantly not be at war with each other, which chimps do, by the way. Um, <laughs> yeah. The if chimps had a common myth, they wouldn't be killing each other off. Um, that's what James Goodall found are angry. in her yeah. work. So yeah. myths are important. They keep, it's, myths are what keep us together. The UN is a complete myth. That all these people believe the same thing for that, you know, f hours that they're there. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. they don't. Um, but <laughs> the, the myth is that if we all come together and we all talk, we're going to have less wars. Um, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. It's a myth. Um, and that's how it works. <sighs> Yeah, I, 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 I pick up what you're putting down. I, I, I hear you with that. So we're talking about the wiring of our basic ideal of, of, you know, just trying to get a little better, maybe even. And that has to go all the way back to the very, very root, because that's why we're all standing here. You know, we've the human body has survived a lot of uh, attacks, smallpox. That's why we're, all of us who survived that, you know, we got through, at least in Europe, you know, because our family was, was you know, the families that survived, the plague, all these things. And the, there's a certain wiring that goes along as, as we, 
get better at doing things because the guys that couldn't make these decisions, yeah, I, I can see that. And I also understand your, your point about chimps versus us and our ability to create context where even if we do disagree, we might be able to sort out some kind of middle ground. Like, hey, hey, I need a whiteboard and I can explain this better. A chimp doesn't, at least as far as I know, doesn't have the ability to say, hang on, slow down. Let me, this is more like a devil in a blue dress or Carmen in a red dress. And you're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Like you can create context because we're able to, uh, you know, because we have the, the ability to, to communicate with language. And that's exactly. uh, interesting. Okay, okay. If you offered a chimp mm -hmm. one banana Ooh, yes. to, they have a choice of one banana now or a thousand bananas if they wait tomorrow for an answer, which one do you think a chimp's going to choose? Mm -hmm. The one I'm banana. A, oh, okay? uh, yeah, me too. Okay, so the chimps don't see the future like we see this future. That doesn't mean chimps aren't <laughs> smart. Um, right. Chimps are highly intelligent but they, they don't have the, the future that we do. They don't have that story, that myth, the myth of the promise that they're gonna get a thousand bananas tomorrow um, because they just they say, no, I got, the, I got this banana, I'm good. Um, I don't believe, I, don't, I can't even understand this concept of having a thousand bananas tomorrow if I trade off for this one. Yeah. Um, well, and really, it, what's a chimp going to do with a thousand damn bananas? You know, they're just going to spoil. And uh, it's like, no, no, no. <laughs> well, just... they don't even think that way. Chimps yeah. don't think that. They I... never even get that far <laughs> because they, they can't, they don't have the myth of there being a future and that there's something to work towards. Chimps are, um, they get, chimps, tribes of chimps um, are, go at war with each other. Mm -hmm. But within their own tribe, chimps, generally get along. You have a, you have a hierarchical character, a male character, just like the lion. He keeps, you know, everybody un under, um, under wraps. And then the females take care of the young. They quabble with each other. Um, and, but we, we have these archetypal characters. They're, they're in all animals and they're in us. And when the archetype is encountered, story is evoked. Okay. So, how does one use this knowledge on a day-to-day -day basis? I mean, if we know that archetypes exist, and Jordan Harbinger talks about archetypes all the time. He's, he's great at this stuff. But what is, what is someone who, who, you know, I don't know, works in, in sales, software sales, or someone who does uh, accounting? How do they use this, this knowledge of archetypes? That's a good question, yeah. It's actually an important question. Um, and we have, you do use it right now. If you ever take a Myers-Briggs test, okay. use it. So the introvert, the extrovert, the, the sensor, the feeler, the um, we, uh, the thinker, the feeler. Mm -hmm. um, we we use these archetypes in our per interpersonal relationships. In our um, you know you know if you go to you go to some sort of um, marital counseling, you're going to start with a Myers Briggs test, okay, or something like that. Right. The salesman is it better be your extrovert. I tell you, and your accountant is typically going to be your introvert. And so, through these these archetypal characters, actually these these archetypal characters that think or the feeler and so on, they actually came from Jung. Carl Jung de developed that system. It then became actually he developed all the types. It be then became systemized by Myers Briggs, hmm. who made the test that we all see today. So we have that we have that in us today. But here's the most important part. Is that and so how do we deal with it in a sense? Yeah. Well, we we have to recognize that nothing's going to change. We will always have Don Corleone. We will always have you know Don Gambino. We always have Don Trump. Um, these these archetypal characters will always exist, and so we just have to sort of you know grin and bear it. Sometimes we have, and there'll always be the the hero that fights against them, that fights against the villain, the, um, the dragon, the Darth Vader, whoever that person is. So we're playing roles that have been played before mm -hmm. for at least tens of thousands, at least to 34,000 years ago, if not hundreds of thousands of years before that. Stories that we can't escape. And the best thing is sort of like the, you know, if you recognize the Don, you know, the, the Don Corleone, you know, you have to recognize that he's also he's protecting his own. Yeah, totally. He's the he is the protector and the bully at the same time. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. It's, it's really what it is. You know, uh, the, you know. Of course, you know, during the election, Hillary instead of Hillary, what what can you say good about um, you know on Trump? And she's well, he's a good family man. 
And, you know, the truth is he is a really good, you know, it's a big family, but he's a good family man. So he is both the bully and the protector at the same time, Hmm. the same way as the lion in this, in the zoo. So we have to realize that um, there's, there's a flip side to every, to everything and that we can't escape who we are. I believe that there'll be some distant descendant of both of ours that are interviewed just like us today. (laughs) It's a true format. And, the, the same questions will be asked and the same answers will be given. And I believe that those same questions, and those same answers were given by the ancient Greeks, the Romans, the Phoenicians, the Egyptians, the Babylonians, and so forth. And then they were, they were asked 34,000 years ago in this Pelican caves when the apprentice came in and he was, he was, um, came to the te- the, the, the shamanic teacher and he said, you know, you know, how, what do I do? You know, what's right. my role here? And, um, and the teacher just, you know, look at the, look at the board. Look at the storyboard. Tell me what you see in these images about yourself, um, and and to prepare for your own hero's journey that you're going to take to go to Africa. Because I believe that they actually the shamanic apprentice actually had to take this journey and come back again. And this was his wasn't just a storyboard. Mm-hmm. It was his map in life mm. that he would. Um, so I believe that these stories and, and this approach has been with us for tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands years ago. And I believe that in hundreds of thousands of years in the future, if we're all still here, some dis- distant descendant of ours will be telling us, <clears throat> will be having this same conversation. So you're saying that the guy in that cave was like the world's first life coach. <laughs> oh, oh, goodness. He's the li- well, he's the first He is the first depicted life coach for sure. Yeah, yeah, um, no, that's great. So it, he, this is what's really cool yeah. is that, so not only does the man transform into uh, – a um, dolphin and a horse and all these sort of things. But the artist made this. So there was multiple perspectives so that the, the man himself shape shifts mm-hmm. from one type of man to another, in a sense, he, he put, takes, he takes a mask on and off. And so this artist is telling us that there can be multiple perspectives in life, right? There's no knowing there's no certainty. There's, um, you know, you, you read the newspaper, scientists discovered today, now we know. Mm-hmm. Well, that's bogus. Yeah. Um, because the, this, art, this artist t- shows us that millions of people had seen this. And they couldn't get past the red disc. And even if they had got past the red disc, would they really have seen these multiple t- perspectives of the artist's vision? Are, are we des- is there some, you know, utopian society ahead of us? I would say we're not going to get much past the lion tech. Well, you know, I don't know if there will be some utopian place, but I do know that Thomas More and Erasmus talked about this at length and wrote about it. And they, they played with the word utopia and utopia because you really can't tell which way it was being said. And they, and they did that on purpose because utopia is a place that we can understand. It's perfect. And, and you know, everybody has what they need and all those kind of things. Utopia, which is self-spelled and almost pronounced exactly the same, is a fictional place. It's no place. And, uh, you know, you're, you're sort of juxtapositioning this whole thing, and it goes all the way back to, you know, Thomas More and Erasmus and, and all the way back to the Greeks and, and, and whoever, some Asian dude up on a mountain. It does go back to these things. We do have these archetypal uh, issues, and we are going to, if you... If you get soft and you allow yourself to be one of the outer ring lions, there is going to be a lion in the middle of the ring, and it's going to marshal things, and it's going to improve its position for its family, for its pride, and it's it's going to do everything it can to create survival. And if that means coalescing power, if that means murdering 10,000 people, guess what's going to happen? <laughs> yep. like those things continue to happen. We always we're always looking for the next Hitler, and that's in some ways smart, but in other ways it, it's a little bit silly because then everything's Hitler, and, and, and you know, the next thing you know, the person who's actually Hitler has come up from behind you because they've slowly gathered power, and and now it's you know too late. So <clears throat> I, I I dig it. I dig the whole idea of it, and, uh, and the exchange of power. Like I'll give you a great example. We were talking to these guys that do a lot of stuff on the blockchain, and they were talking about how they were going to try to end hunger and homelessness by using cryptographic uh, currency. And I'm like, okay, but that's already being worked on. What are you guys doing differently? It's like, well, our system's better. 
matter. And I'm like, all right, you know, I mean, it, it's a hard problem to solve, you know, people that, that need help, but, um, aren't capable of even receiving help. Like, how do you, you know, cause the idea was is to give them money with no strings, but if the person is, is not even capable of running their life, which I'm not, I'm making, making a judgmental thing, like, but a person who physically and mentally cannot run a life, you can't just give them money without dealing with some real ethical problems. So here we have this this problem where not everybody will have everything. We've proven that now, right? Like that for thousands of years, we've never been able to go, here's how everybody gets what they need and remains happy. And they don't just, you know, say, forget that. I don't have enough and do something else. Am I... Am I getting what you're saying, basically, that these problems that the Greeks had, that the Romans had, that the, uh, uh, you know, shoot, go back as far as you want, the Babylonians had, that these big social problems are likely to remain? Yeah, these, these are eternal questions without real solutions. There will always be conflict. There will always be people who um, can't take care of themselves. Um, but in, in an economic sense, mm-hmm. um, or in a physical sense, for sure. And in this image, what we find is we have this older man speaking to the ear of the apprentice. Yes. And so the older man is the wise man. So maybe he can't hunt as as he as he did in the past. Um, maybe he can't, you know, haul in a salmon. Um, maybe he can't yell yell on a micro. Well, yell from the you know across the to tell the story. But he still has value, just as you and I, as we're we're not older, but we're not 22 either, right. that we have no value to any national sports team. Um, but we, we're now telling our story. And that becomes we, we're the leaders, the managers, the thought leaders, all this sort of these type of things. <laughs> yeah. we, we have become the wise men. And, of course, all the people that come on your show as, as well. And we're sharing that, that knowledge that we've gained. And tonight we're uh, on this program, we're sharing knowledge that goes back for tens of thousands of years, which is it's mind, it's mind bending as a concept that we're, you know, we're channeling the palliative mind that's still our own. Um, and finding those stories deep within our side ourselves to share. And we're telling them through lions and chimpanzee and national politics and <laughs> DNA. And it's, um, it's phenomenal. Yeah, it is phenomenal. And you know, it's funny. So today's show that went up, we had Roger Clinton, Bill's brother on the show. And, and I love, I love Roger Clinton. He's such a great guy. And I said, you know, off mic, cause I want to put him on the spot, but he said I could quote him. So it's all right to do so. But, um, I said, you know, what do you think, man? What, what about all this Donald Trump stuff? And he said, listen, this will, this will all pass. Everything's mm-hmm. temporary. All these things that everybody's all fired up about, you know, it, it's not as bad as we want it to be. And that ability for for a Clinton to say that, to say, just slow down. You know, we've seen this before. We've seen crazy before. We'll see crazy again. It, you know, and we're talking just 200 years here of history, you know, with our history, or, or 200 and a quarter if you want to be fancy. But this is, uh, this is stuff we've seen before. You know, if people say this was the most corrupt presidency ever, okay, let's talk intelligently about 44 other presidencies. Can you do it? No. Well, then what the hell are you doing? It's just hyperbole. Let's calm down a little bit and let's, uh, you know, let's spend some time reflecting and looking for that wisdom that you're talking about on the wall. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. The lion in the the tank at the Oregon Zoo will be replaced. That lion at the top of the pack. And he will be, you know, there will be another lion. Uh, Yeah. And maybe that young lion at the bottom um, and he'll he'll be the Don, um, yeah. And he'll be the bully and the protector at the same time. And and the pride will complain and hem and haw about who's exactly. in the middle yeah. until it gets sorted out. You know, so it's, it is just the same thing. Another, it's the same story. Yeah. The other funny thing, uh, the Portland Zoo also has great concerts. There's a great concert series that plays in there every summer. They have bands. Absolutely, that we in. saw. Um, Oh, just a few weeks ago. Pink Martini. Please Pink say- Martini, were you there? No, but we almost bought plane tickets. I swear to God. I swear to God. We almost came up specifically for Pink Martini because they're such a great band. And, and uh, my girl and I were dying to go up there. We have friends up there. We're dying to go up there and, and see a show uh, in that venue because what a neat place to see a show. 
Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah, we were there. That was like a month ago. Well, Pink Martini, you know, this is, of course, not a big plug show for Pink Martini, Portland band, but they they also played the Schnitzer in the wintertime. We we saw them at the, I think it was the Schnitzer. We saw them for New Year's Eve at for like the midnight show or something. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, lots of fun. Um, now we're great. getting somewhere. Talking about Pink Martini. Yes. Yeah, it's cool. <laughs> Yeah, well, definitely. If when you do, when you do head this way to see Pick Martini, you know, touch base with us and we'll we'll meet up. It's um, I yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I have built up a a lot of reasons to go up to Portland. Of course, my girlfriend and her super dear friends, but also Rob Nyer, the author. He's been on the show a bunch of times. You've been on the show once. You'll be on again already. I can tell you that. And then also is a musician up there, Logan Lynn, who's a, sort of a friend of the show. So we've got a lot of reasons to come up there and I'm always wanting to run around and talk to folks. So yeah, for sure. Looking forward to coming up and hanging. And uh, anytime you're in Southern California, please stop in. Absolutely. Hey, everybody, we're talking to Bernie Taylor and, I, and you know, just a great ride, man. And I, I can't wait to put you up right next to my buddy Gay- Gaylord DeWald because we also talk about a lot of these things so um, it'll be neat to continue the conversation because you're pushing me in a new direction and, and I like to I like to be willing to learn and be uncomfortable and, and you definitely put me there and, and in a great way so thank you so much well thank you Pia I'd love to be on the show again and we'll have another session 